interesting first line of the gospel today. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And then immediately it switches into him talking about him being at the temple very early in the morning. And we no longer hear any more about the Mount of Olives. But the gospel writer is trying to set up how important Christ's ministry was in teaching. He was making this trek between the Mount of Olives and the temple every day. Now we may not think it's very far, but remember Jesus didn't have a car to go out and start up and drive to every day. He was making the walk, a walk so he could teach at the temple. And while he was there this day, the scribes and Pharisees brought this woman to him. And they posed this catch-22 question. You know, catch-22, doesn't matter how you answer it, you're wrong. They wanted to know if Jesus agreed with the law of Moses that they should stone her. And we have to remember that the Romans were ruling the land at this time. And the Romans had a law that said only they could practice capital punishment. So if Christ told them, yes, go ahead and stone her, then they would report him to the Romans so he could be persecuted by them. On the other hand, if he put into practice his teaching of peace and love and said, no, let her go, then they would go to the people of Israel and said, see, he's not one of us because he does not practice the laws that were handed down by Moses. And what does Christ do? He stoops down and starts writing in the dirt with his finger. Doesn't tell us what he's writing, just that he's using his finger. It's very adamant that he's using his finger to write. And if we want to think of Christ as divine at this point, that may lead us to believe that what he's, he's writing is the same thing that happened earlier in the Bible when the divine person used their finger to write the Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone. Maybe he's writing the Great Commandment with his finger. Or in Jeremiah we heard that the names of those who fall away from God which maybe the Pharisees and scribes are by testing him, will be written in the dirt. So maybe if we're thinking of Christ as divine, maybe he's writing their names in the dirt. But what came to my mind is the painting of Michael, Michelangelo's painting on the Sistine Chapel of the creation of Adam, where Christ is reaching out trying to touch Adam's fingers. Maybe the College of Cardinals felt that finger pointing at them this week saying, make sure you make the right choice. And we pray that that choice was perfect. And we are sure that it will be. But I like to think in this story, this writing in the dirt was not Jesus in his divinity. I like to think of it being Jesus in his humanness. He's taking the time to ponder the question making the inquisitioners maybe a little uncomfortable because he didn't come back with an answer immediately. It's not unusual, even today. If we have a question that's posed to us that might be tough, we take some time to think about it. Maybe we sit down and start jotting, doodling on paper while we're thinking. Of course, he didn't have pencil and paper. Pencils weren't even invented till the 16th century. So he stooped down and was writing in the dust. But when he was ready, he raised up, eye level, position of equality with the scribes and the Pharisees, and then he threw their catch-22 question back at them with a catch-22 comment. If you don't have sin, go ahead. If you do, it's unspoken, but you should not stone this woman. And then he immediately stoops down again and continues writing in the dust ignoring them. As much as saying, you're not that important to me, what you've done. And they get that feeling, so they start wandering away, because they're not going to get satisfaction from him. 
We hear they wander away one by one until there's only one person left. And that's the woman, the woman who stayed at his side. And when he asked her, who has condemned you? She goes, no one, sir. Did he condemn her then? No. Did he forgive her? Not in so many words. What he did was say, then I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. So what he has done is said, your past is gone. Start a new life. And that's what happens for us when we go to the sacrament of reconciliation. When we go in and confess our sins, and at the end the priest prays the prayer of absolution. And that prayer doesn't say God forgives you. It said God absolves you. It means your past is wiped away. They're gone. Go now and be a new person. Go forth. Your old life is gone. Start a new one. We hear that same theme in the first two readings today. From Isaiah, remember not the events of the past. The things of long ago consider not. See, I am doing something new. And then in the writings of St. Paul, forgetting what lies behind, but straining forward to what lies ahead. I continue my pursuit toward the goal, the prize of God's upward calling in Christ Jesus. The past is gone. It's time to move ahead. Today, as we have since the start of Lent, we started out in our penitential rite praying the Confidior. The Confidior, the second line, says, I confess to you, my brothers and sisters. It's an opportunity for us as a community, opportunity for us as the people of God to acknowledge to one another that we are sinful. And the second to the last line says, pray for me, my brothers and sisters. So we ask one another to help us in our weaknesses. Pray to Lord God for us, to help us start that new life, to go forward, forgetting our past life. And there is a wonderful way to put that confidior prayer to action, put those words into place. And that's at the communal reconciliation. Our annual Lenten communal reconciliation is Monday, March 25th, the Monday of Holy Week. It's an opportunity for us to come together as a community, for us to be together as the people of God. And we start out with a short prayer service that says, yes, I am a sinner. I acknowledge before all of you that I am a sinner and I ask all of you to pray for me. Then you will partake in a private confession with a priest. There'll be about 20 priests here. Just want to make sure that you understand, if you haven't been there before, that that confession is private only between you and the priest and God. Nobody else. It also has the seal of the confessional, even though you're not actually in the confessional. So please join us. Come. Acknowledge your sinfulness, but with your brothers and sisters, and ask your brothers and sisters to pray for you. And as you're with the priest, might be here in this corner, your brothers and sisters can be praying for you as when they are there, you can pray for them. It's a wonderful, wonderful way for us to act together as the community of believers. Now, in the gospel today, there are a number of characters. And many times as we hear stories, read stories, it helps us to identify with the characters. It helps us put it in the middle of the story. So I'm going to ask, what characters do you identify your life with? And it may change as different parts of your life. And you know, there's one character in this story that isn't even talked about. But he's there. Remember, the woman was accused of adultery. Where is the man? Do you identify parts of your life with that man, the person who stays in the background? 
The person who doesn't come forward to acknowledge their part. The person who lets somebody else take the responsibility for them. Or have parts of your life can you identify with the Pharisees and scribes where you condemn other people for their actions instead of letting God do the judging? Or how about the woman? Can you identify with that woman? Here is a woman who was brought forward and accused, but yet she is the only one in this story that stayed by Christ's side. Everybody else left. And she could have left at the same time. But she stayed with Christ. She put her hands and her life in Christ's hands. Can you identify with her? I know we'd like to say we identify with Christ, but we cannot be Christ. But what we can do is live our life to be Christ-like. So as we go forward, I invite you to that sacrament of reconciliation. Remember, as a child, when we baptize somebody, the baptismal font, the waters from the baptismal font, washes away their original sin. And they dress in a new garment to go forth in their new life. In the sacrament of, sacrament of reconciliation, your confessing your sins and asking for absolution washes away your past sins and dresses you Christ-like. And you can go forth and be in your new life. So when you're ever faced with that tough question, that tough part of your life, take a few moments. Maybe doodle a little bit before you pop up with the answer. But don't do like me, because when I doodle, I play myself in tic-tac-toe and I always lose. But one place I won't lose, I will be here for that communal reconciliation because I know that's a winning hand. I invite you to join me and be one with me in the people of God.